the reason this company exists is because in 2014, the Jamaica Stock Exchange had asked me to speak at their January conference. And the story was very simply that I needed to tell them what would it take to get the Jamaica diaspora to invest back into Jamaica. We have about 3 million Jamaicans living overseas, that's our estimate, mainly in the United States, Canada, and the UK. 2.7 million live in Jamaica. So our diaspora is pretty large, fairly active, and fairly concentrated. Yes, we do have them in elsewhere, but those are the real concentrated areas. And I had served on the Jamaica Diaspora Advisory Board as the first future leaders representative for the USA. And so that gave me additional insight at these events, speak with members of the diaspora to understand how they were thinking and what were their issues. If you're in Jamaica, you know how hard it is to open an account, whether a bank account or an account to do investments. Well, if you live in the diaspora, it's even more frustrating because we are used to things just being much smoother and working faster. So we had five preconditions, in my opinion, for it to work. Uh, number one was that we have low trust in the government. That's thankfully improving, but a diaspora bond for investments is not what we would like to see. For education, for infrastructure, for health, that's no problem. A diaspora bond does make sense, similar to what Israel would do. But for investment purposes, we don't want it to go through the government. It would have to go through a private company or through the private sector. The second one is that it would have to be run by a Jamaican with experience in the Jamaican system, working in finance here, but working in finance in either the US, UK or Canada. But goes down to Jamaica more often than the members of the diaspora. Most of them have moved and don't visit Jamaica as often. You need somewhere to run it who knows on the ground who to do business with, who not to do business with, and how things are working. The third one is that they would need a partner, a financial partner on the ground in Jamaica that's known by the diaspora. So that's limited to essentially five names in the financial world. But that trust was going to be important. The fourth one that I said to them is critical, is that they want to invest on the US securities law. That's the one that most people know and trust. That's the largest capital market in the world, so you'd have to be done under U.S. securities law. They do not want to invest under Jamaican law. It's not that we don't trust the court system, but we understand the inefficiencies in the court system and how long it takes to get a resolution. We don't have that problem in the United States, especially at the corporate level. And then fifth and final is that it had to be publicly traded. You know, while everybody thinks that when you, you migrate to foreign, you migrate to a country like the United States, Canada, UK. In Jamaican dollars, we're making a lot of money. But in, in our home currency, we aren't. Most, most of us in the diaspora are just barely middle class and doing the same thing everybody else is doing, running on that hamster wheel, trying to make ends meet, while also sending money back to home here in Jamaica. This is over 2.2 billion US dollars sent you know, per year. Uh, majority, about 67% or so from the United States alone. It's important to understand that we're not usually accredited investors. We're not usually high net worth individuals. So we can't participate in a hedge fund, in a private equity fund, in a venture capital fund. A public vehicle is what would make sense. And so that's what I said to them. Uh, not necessarily intending for me to launch that. It was always for them to launch it. Uh, since then, nobody has launched that kind of a company and so I decided that I should make a move after getting a few phone calls from some investment banks here in Jamaica who decided that's what they wanted to do. You know, a, a few of these investment companies called and said why didn't I launch that kind of a company? And I told them it wasn't for me to launch, I was telling them what they were supposed to do. I had preferred to look at getting capital in the Caribbean to invest into US opportunities that they would not normally see, right? Giving them access to opportunities that I would see through our family office groups and some of the, the wealthy individuals we got to spend time with and, and build relationships with. That's why we've now launched this company. That is what our framework looks like because we think wealth creation does follow very simple rules and we need to be careful, as Warren Buffett would say, you know, he doesn't look for seven foot bars to jump over we look for one foot bars to step over, we're doing the same thing. So we're not looking for turnarounds, we're not looking to take a company out of bankruptcy. 
Uh, we're not looking to do the hard things. For now, we're looking for very simple things. So uh, it's not that complicated to find those. You, you just need to stay disciplined and work with the framework and not, not get away from your framework. I've seen successful people have a framework and then go and do things outside of that and then that causes problems and it pulls down other things. So, so disciplined investing is critical. Holding for the long term is important. And then making sure that you understand the environment and the industries and where these companies are operating. Preferably we can help open doors to have them scale faster as well. We're not just depending on management to sit there and go and work for us essentially. We also want to work to increase the value of our percentage ownership, right? In, expand the size of the pie so our percentage ownership of that pie is worth more instead of trying to own more of a smaller pie. And, and that's a good thing about when an economy is growing. The way we look at Jamaica and why we're so bullish is, is not just because it had the best performing stock exchange last year or in the last five years. It's not just because no exchange traded for in the United States has any Jamaican stocks in their portfolio, even though they have Vietnam, Kazakhstan, Sri Lanka, the most frontier of emerging markets in, and we think they would buy our stock. Those aren't actually the most important reasons. When we think about per capita income, Jamaica is somewhere in the 5,500 US a year for per capita income. We tend not to talk about that. The Latin American Caribbean region average is 12,500 or roughly in that region. The average. So Jamaica is below 50% of the average. So if we're seeing positive growth rates, we're seeing low inflation, actually below target inflation, fairly stable exchange rate within a band that the central bank is working on, capital friendly, so it's easier for us to move money in and out, to convert money as needed, good governance in place in terms of the companies that we want to invest in, business friendly government and that has been between transitions this doesn't matter which party it's been business friendly because of since the imf deal that they signed well that means that incomes are going to be growing as well so if jamaica's per capita income can go up by just a thousand us dollars just a thousand dollars gets it to around six thousand five hundred they're still roughly at fifty percent of latin america and the caribbean region so we think a thousand dollar increase is reasonable within the next decade if all things continue to improve the way they have. But then that means that you know, a thousand US, 2.7 million people, and it's a per capita income. But then we're looking at 2.7 billion US dollars per year in new income that is going to be within this economy to spend. And so we think that is, that's real money and you can tell where that is going to be spent. You just look at all the statistics of any emerging market and how those economies have grown over a 15-year, 20-year trajectory. Jamaica is no different.